Dobro dan everybody and welcome to another beautiful day here in Croatia. Uh, I am, as you know, Adventures with Sarah. Sarah and I'm here with uh, Andrew Valone and we have another friend to introduce to you today. So today's adventure, we are going to take you on a live virtual tour of the Palace of Diocletian here in Split. So this is a really exciting event. I hope that you guys will really enjoy it. We're going to try and fit it into about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, you can come back and watch it anytime. It will be posted here, uh, recorded, so you can sit down with your friends and family and watch it later tonight if you want. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and let our local guide take it away. So this is Yoshko. Hello, Yoshko. Hi guys, how are you? So tell us a little bit about yourself, Yoshko. Well, uh, I'm the local from Split, born and raised here, and I'm the licensed tour guide in Split. So I turned my passion into my profession, showing people my city. And I will, today I'm going to take you on a, a historical tour of the Artesian Palace and the old town. Um, uh, Tour will be around an hour and 15 minutes. You are very welcome to ask the questions, and um, whenever you're ready, we can start. Sure. I think we can. Just one more note as we go along. As he mentioned, please do ask questions. I'm going to be on camera, so I'll be monitoring your questions, and I can ask him. Also, if we happen to lose signal when we go into Diocletian's palace, because uh, we're going to go underneath underground, just Bear with us and hang on because we will be back shortly. So I promise uh, we have a pretty good signal today uh, and we will be back. So just hold on and bear with us. All right, Yoshko, take it away. Okay, guys, so welcome to Split. Welcome to the central and capital of region called Dalmatia. And Dalmatia is one of the five regions in Croatia. World Dalmatia is in use for the last 2,000 years when all Romans coming here. So when Romans arrived here, they want to conquer all these local Iranian tribes who are living along the coast of the Adriatic Sea. And more or less they conquered it except one, which was especially living around Split, 100 miles north and south from Split. So basically it took Romans 250 years of fighting with them to conquer it. And after 250 years, finally, in the very beginning of first century after Christ, they conquer it. And in the honor of such a brave warriors, who caused them so many problems, because Romans worship good warriors, they named all this province after the tribe, and the name of the tribe was Dalmatians. So name up, Dalmatia is in use for the last 2,000 years. The region is still called Dalmatia, and we all who live here, first I will say I'm Croatian, second I will say I'm a Dalmatian, just like the dogs. And you know dogs, <laughs> Dalmatian dogs, it's originally breed from here, genetically proved, matched, but the birthplace of Dalmatian dog is right here in Dalmatia. And originally Romans were used for hunting. That's a hunting dog, not fire truck dog. Okay? <laughs> so welcome to Split, welcome to the capital and center of Dalmatian region. Now we are standing in front of the south wall of the palace, which was built by the Roman Emperor Diocletian in 305 AD. So guess what? He made this palace for his retirement days. Did you know maybe that he was the only emperor in the 500 years of the Roman Empire who managed to survive to enjoy his retirement? 90% of them were killed, 5% of diseases, 4% replaced by natural reasons. He's the only one in 500 years who survived to enjoy his retirement. And he decided to come right here. Now the most important question is this one. Why one Roman emperor, the most powerful person of the empire, which was big as 12 Californian sizes, why he pick up this place for spent the most the latest days of his life? Because he liked to farm cabbages, didn't he? Ah, yeah. I, I see you, you were reading something. But you know, I like to say the name of our town, Split, is a perfect name in English language. Why? Because Split in English language means to separate, to divide something. And here in town, we have four different separated, divided, split theories why Emperor decided to come here. So there's not only one, there are actually four of them. Okay. According to the first theory, many historians say that he was born in Salona, city which is only six miles away from here. Salona today is a fantastic archaeological site, but at that time Salona was the fourth largest city of the full Roman Empire. So population was around 60,000. So many historians saying that probably he was born in Salona, so he wanted to come back home, what people usually do when they are a little bit older. But if you go to Montenegro, they will tell you that he was born in Montenegro, because his name in Latin language was Diocles, and Dioclea was the name of village in Montenegro at that time, today name of town is Dukla. So it's still a little questionable, maybe he was born in Montenegro, maybe in Salona, for sure we know that he was from this side of Adriatic Sea, not from the Italian side. So first bit theory, maybe this was his birthplace. 
Second theory is this one. You know, Romans, they were very, very superstitious. They worship astronomy a lot. And according to one legend, he gathered all the leading astronomists of that time. And he said, please pick me the best spot of the empire by positions of the stars, moon, planet, sun. And over there, I'm going to make my palace for retirement. There's also third split theory. He arrived here with the age of 60, which was for that time a little bit old. And we know for sure that he had the problems with the back, with the realm. And at the end of our beautiful promenade, now, now we can see because of this. Well, but we'll walk. Come maybe. Yeah. yeah, let's go over here. Let's walk over here. Yeah. At the end of our promenade, where the small boats are parked over there. Uh -huh. Sometimes you can walk there and feel a little bad smell of the rotten necks. People think it's a dirty or sewage there. No. Underground there you can find almost 120 little sulfur springs. Which stinks a little bit, but sulfur springs are excellent for physical rehab of your body to fix your rheumatic problems. So, third theory, maybe he was here for rehab. And there's also a fourth theory, very interesting. Our archaeologists, when they were digging, exploring in the north side of the palace, they discovered a whole system of underground water channels, typical for manufacturers which producing clothes, textile or fabric. And they also discovered little fragments, pieces of the purple colors. At that time, only emperor could wear purple color. So our archaeologists saying that here in this palace, we had some kind of manufacturers for producing high fashion clothes of that time, extremely luxury, expensive textile. Like today, Armani, Versace, Gucci, whatever, which cost a lot and which could provide actually huge income to finance his very expensive retirement days. He spent here for 10 years. So he needed lots of money to finance this 10 years of retirement. So let's say four split theories is financial reasons. Now I gave you four split theories which one you prefer? Uh, that he liked to grow cabbages. Ah, <laughs> so, so we have fifth, we have fifth here. theory here, yeah. okay. So we have fifth theory. Okay. I also have my own theory here. Maybe right. he maybe he has some girlfriend here, you know? Men can do crazy things for a girl, girls, right? But you know what? Officially, he had one wife, one daughter. Uh, Prisca and Valeria. But we also know for sure that during 10 years of his retirement here, his wife was not here with him. She was in palace in Turkey, in Nicomedia. Today that's Izmir town near ah. Istanbul. Nice. You know, it's hard to say which theory is correct. You know, they all sound reasonable. Uh, maybe one, maybe two, maybe combination of all of them, maybe none. Because we cannot say for sure which theory is correct. We have one nickname for our town, Split. So Split is a one mystery town because we're still guessing, we still not, don't know actually why Emperor was here. So guys, welcome to Split, welcome to one mystery town. <laughs> okay? I have, I, have my other, I have a few theories of my own Please. and my theories would be, number one, I would say that he is the smartest Roman Emperor because he didn't get murdered. And that for his time for later Roman Empire was pretty amazing. And also because this was a really common place for Roman generals to retire. And he was a military man, so yep. it m might have been in sympathy with his generals that he wanted to come here because that was a typical way to get Roman generals out of Rome so they wouldn't cause a problem, right? Well, name of town is split, so basically we have four or five main theories, but guys, you can create your own theory, you know, split theories. That's okay. what, yep, that's what we love about history. You uh, can now let's go see the palace on the map over okay. there, okay. and uh, that map shows you originally how palace looked at 305 AD when it was uh, built here. Because palace today, after 1,700 years, it looks a little bit different. So let's move over there with okay. a nice map of the palace from the beginning of fourth century. Okay. So just to kind of give you guys a little historical perspective, when we talk about 305 AD, that's really late Roman Emperor, Empire. We are at the point where Rome is basically falling apart and we're just on the cusp of the movement from Rome in Rome as we know it to New Rome which is Constantinople and that's going to happen with Constantine who's within just a generation of Diocletian. So what you're going to be seeing today is architecture that's late and we don't really have anything great in Italy from that time period so this is why this is a very special site. We see the best that the Roman Empire had to offer at the time when it was starting to crumble that's not in, Byz in Byzantium in Istanbul and in Turkey but still here in Europe proper. So let's have a look. Okay guys, so this is a picture of the palace that originally looked like at that time. Now we are standing right here. At that time we would be swimming here because that sea was not there. That sea was literally hitting those walls. And the first promenade was built in 15th century when Venice arrived here. Venice arrived, Venice Republic in 15th century. They ruled almost 400 years over Dalmatia. So basically when Venetians arrived, they, then they made extension of the promenade. So we're actually facing this south wall of the palace 
which you can see right there. Okay. And uh, there is a tower mm -hmm. over there, which is this one here. Okay. Okay. The second tower was right there in, be in between, uh, in between the middle of promenade with the two small palm trees. Ah. So just for your orientation, how big size of the palace is? Palace is big, almost like six soccer fields, which means enormous. Never seen before in the Roman Empire such a huge, enormous palace. And actually, we can divide this palace in three sections. So this was Emperor's home, his residence. This was religious part with the temple of Jupiter. You know, Jupiter was the top Roman god. In one moment of Diocletian ruling, he pronounced himself a son of the Jupiter. Very humble, huh? It's still preserved in our town. Today we we're going to see it on our tour. This here was his mausoleum, the place where he was buried. His sarcophagus was inside. But usually people ask me, well, is, is, the, is he still there? No. Why? Because in 7th century, when Christians from this city, Salon, are coming to live inside of this palace, basically they kick emperor out of his mausoleum because he was one of the biggest persecutors of the Christians. And actually they changed the purpose of his pagan Roman mausoleum, Roman Roman temple, into the Christian Catholic cathedral. And we never discovered evidence of his sarcophagus or his body in it because when Christians arrived here, there were so many of him, they want to get rid of any evidence of existence of this temple. One thing you cannot see here on this religious part, but clearly you can see it from here. It's our symbol of our town. It's a bell tower. You can see a little bit top of the bell tower. Mm -hmm. Actually, bell tower was built right here, but 1,000 years after this palace in the medieval times. That's why it's not on this map and it's dedicated to our patron saint of Split, Bishop of St. Domius, who was actually executed during the Diocletian persecutions. So the man, Emperor Diocletian, who made this palace, he killed our patron saint and that's why Christians made Bell Tower right here. The third section of the palace is this one where the ordinary people were living, his servants, soldiers, and this manufacturers were producing this fancy purple textile. So this palace was one typical combination, mixture of residential part and the Roman military camp because each Roman military camp always was divided with two main streets in the shape of cross, you see. Cardo Street from north to south and Decumanus from east to the west. The only one place where he was a meeting with locals was this square called the Emperor's Square or Peristyle because he proclaimed himself son of the God, so son of the God never goes where ordinary people live. If you would like to see son of the God, you must come to his square because this was entrance to his house. At that time there were 16 pro, uh, uh, protecting towers around the palace and there are four entrances for four doors, four gates in this palace. The main entrance was on the very north called the Golden Gate. Then on the east you have a Silver Gate, on the south you have a Bronze Gate and on the west you have iron gate so it's easy to remember it's like olympic medals you know gold silver bronze and iron and bronze gate over there which we're going to soon enter in uh, this was the smallest gate that was actually emergency exit in the case of attack dangerous someone tried to kill him maybe his wife come back from turkey man or him something this was escape route from his home directly to the ships because at that time ships were lined up here there was no problem so this is the original look of the palace at 305. Palace after 1,700 years looks still a bit different, of course. So why palace is so special today? Because still today, inside of these walls, living around 900 people, which basically you cannot find anywhere else in the Mediterranean Sea. If you go to Rome, you will see beautiful Roman ruins, and you will also see that no one lives inside. Diocletian Palace is a literally Roman ruin from, from beginning of 4th century, still 900 people living inside of these walls. And thanks to this fact that people still living inside of one Roman ruin, UNESCO, 1979, they put palace with the old town on the World Heritage List, which means palace and the old town is under protection of UNESCO. That means the locals who live inside of the walls are not allowed to build anything new. 90% of homes inside is private property, so if they want they inherit it through the generations, so basically if they want to do some restoration, they can do only inside of their homes, nothing outside. For example, no new windows, no new balconies, no new houses, no new floors, no new extensions. Um, for example, you can see this southern wall originally had 42 arches, beautifully open for the fresh air and sea view for the emperor while he's walking. And you can see actually see what's left over today. You see you see. We still have a wall and original columns are there, but locals literally made rooms in between original columns 
which is really something special. Maybe it looks a little bit funny, but it's working for the people. People usually ask me how is living in a palace. You will see a little bit on our tour. Our apartments are very small, tiny. Locals don't have gardens, yards, no parking lot. It's a pedestrian zone. Um, six months can be very busy, crazy, noisy, touristic season. Uh, no schools for kids, for example, inside. But uh, still 900 people living inside. It makes this palace alive and a unique open air living museum. I call it open air living monument in the whole of the Mediterranean. Very cool. All right, shall now we go? Let's see this picture. Let's actually let's see 3D bronze model. Okay. For better understanding of the palace. So Andrew, yes, you've been to Croatia a lot. How many times have you been to Split? Uh, 25 times probably. <laughs> 30, something like that. So Split is just a really convenient place that for those of you that are watching. If you do want to visit Croatia, this is a really excellent place to fly into because there are direct flights from Amsterdam and the airport's really close and this is a great jumping off point for all of those beautiful islands that we have been visiting. So you can come and stay in Split, see the palace, then you can go to Trogir where we started, you can go out to the islands. So it's very convenient if you just want to have a, a sense of the Dalmatian coast. Okay guys, this is a 3D bronze model of that picture for you to have better understanding of the palace. So actually we're facing this wall, the south wall of the palace and this tower here is that one on the corner right there. It's still preserved. So actually this was emperor's home, his residence. This was religious part and the ordinary part for servants, soldiers and this manufacturers for clothes. On the religious part, you can see actually two more temples which are not on that picture and actually today they are not existing. This was the temple of Venus, mother of fertility, very worshiped by the Romans. And this was the temple of Cybele. Cybele was mother earth, mother nature. Um, this cult was imported from Turkey, you know, Romans they like something that they have problems with, let's say copy paste <laughs> so cult was imported from turkey but today these two temples are gone they don't exist they're existing thanks to our heavy history jupiter temple is still preserved this was his mausoleum which was converted in in seventh century into the christian catholic cathedral and the bell tower was built right here thousand years after this palace symbol of our town dedicated to our patron saint of uh, of, of split saint dominus here you can see one very interesting detail, the palace sitting on a slope. So if you come from the side, you will see that northern part of the palace is on a higher ground than the residential part, which is on lower ground. Usually people think this is a mistake of the sculpture who made it smaller. Maybe he was making this part before lunch and this was after lunch, after a good bottle of Dalmatian wine. <laughs> but no, this is a natural slope, palace sitting on one natural slope. So because of this slope, that's why we have the basements in the palace, which soon we're going to explore. Because ba and basements can be found only under emperor's home. You cannot find it under religious part or ordinary part. And the reason is this slope. Because if palace sitting on a slope, we needed, they needed basically basements here to lift up emperor's home, to make it nice level with north side of the palace. At the same time to isolate emperor's home from the moisture from the sea and from some underground waters what we can find in the basements. So basically he can be nicely exposed up to the sunshine. Today we will use that actually basements a little bit. You will see the basements. The function was to support Emperor's home and today they are like a mirror how Emperor's home looked at that time on the upper floor because palace doesn't look like this today. This is the original look of 305. How palace looks today we can see from the second bronze model which is right over there. So basically in this 20 yards from here to there we're going to walk over 1700 years of history here. So every hour step will be almost close to 100 years. Okay, are you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. But before we go there, I want to show you one, one this little thing here. Okay. Beautiful day, by the way. It's about 77 degrees here today. Sunny and basically no tourists. On a normal day, how many people would be here? Uh, this is June. Uh, usually, uh, it's a packed in June. We have lots of this uh, bus tours, cruise ships, uh, yeah. individual guests. It's popular for sailors, so it's it's usually packed. But this is pretty empty for this time of the year. You know, it's pretty enjoyable. We hope, we hope everybody's hoping that tourism is coming back. That will things will improve. But let's wait. And we'll see. We are we are hoping for the best. So, guys, one little question. Do you know maybe how our town got the name Split? <laughs> you had some theories. <laughs> uh, no, usually people think according to banana split, uh, yeah. which is not true, of no. course. Uh, according to this beautiful yellow 
flower which is called uh, Bernistra in Croatian or Scottish or Spanish broom because you know all Greeks they come in here 300 years before Romans in 4th century BC they brought grapes and olives here in Dalmatia if you're going to visit Alan Park or Chulavis you know you will find remains of Greek settlements right there so basically according to the old Greek language name for this bush is Aspalatos Aspalatos, Spalato, split, split for yeah. the century. Mm -hmm. So our town split most likely, let's say 99% got the name according to these beautiful yellow flowers, which, and this is the perfect time of year to visit our town and Dalmatia, why? Because May and June, it's actually blooming time for this, uh, for this beautiful flowers and the fragrance, the, the scent is, is like jasmine, something like jasmine. So Aspalatos on Greek language. We've been seeing this everywhere on the everywhere, islands right? too. Yeah, it's beautiful. Guys, would you like one fun fact? Yep, sure. Okay. Did you know that our town split as the world capital of sport? I did not know that. Everybody's surprised. You know why? Because Split has a population of only 200,000 people. 75 athletes from Split hold 94 Olympic medals in 11 different sports. Really? Plus all in total, seven basketball players from our city played in NBA. Two of them hold four NBA rings. Tony Kukoc, three Chicago Bulls, and Jean Tabak, Houston Rockets, 94-95. Like he was rookie, I don't think you remember him. People ask me, what's your secret here, you know? And I say, my friends, maybe you can try some split water. <laughs> win some Olympic medal. You know? <laughs> by the way, we don't buy water here, you know, it's perfectly fine for drinking. The same water was drank by the emperor, but it's still coming from the same river and the same spring. Wow. If you want to see all these bronze medals, over there, maybe afternoon, if you want to go into walk from the old glass black building to Marina, along that uh, waterfront, you will see all these bronze plates with the name of athlete, uh, which sport, which man, or which city was Olympics and which year. So guys, welcome uh, welcome to the world capital of sport as well. <laughs> okay, now let's see the model, how palace actually looks uh, today after 1,700 So I hope you guys are enjoying this. For those of you who are just joining us this morning, I know it's morning in the US. Uh, we are here in Split. We're being uh, joined by Yoshko, who is our local guide here in Split, who is graciously doing a wonderful virtual tour of Split and Diocletian's Palace for you this morning. Uh, we're gonna run about hour and 15 minutes or so. So if you wanna watch all of it now, that's great. Otherwise, I it will be posted and you can watch uh, again later on. So guys, this is how Palace looks today maybe if you want to move from the south side okay. over there because where we're we standing are standing right here now actually we're facing the south wall so guys this is actually more bronze smaller how palace looks today as you can see palace is very very different there are hundreds of houses inside why because over the centuries simply locals built their own houses they smash crash emperor's home to use rocks to make their own houses and once palace became saturated with all these houses from 12th and 13th century the western wall is gone, smashed, and actually life started to move outside of the palace to the old town. So actually this is called Diocletian Palace, that's called the old town from the medieval times. Old town and uh, Diocletian Palace today is just like one big giant piece because it's all connected together. So what is originally preserved of Roman times? So three walls, one, two, three, three towers out of 16, one, two, three. All four doors preserved, Golden Gate, Silver Gate, Bronze Gate and the Iron Gate. Mausoleum preserved as our Catholic Cathedral. Emperor Square preserved. Vestibule, this was entrance to his home, is preserved. Jupiter Temple is preserved. And the basement under his home is completely preserved. Basically that's all uh, and only what is preserved in Roman times, all the rest is uh, medieval times. So this area of palace in Old Town is under protection of UNESCO from 1979, which means no new construction, no new additions. Palace must stay preserved in time from 1979. So palace today looks a little bit different. And here we say that our town, the palace gave birth to our town. So actually how old is our town? What, exactly 1,716 years. Wow, so yeah, you know. <laughs> Now, let's go enter the basement. Okay, just a note for our viewers, we're going into the basements now, which are very thick stone walls, so I can't guarantee that our cell phone signal is gonna hang, hold up. 
But if it doesn't, don't worry, uh, just stick with us and we will get reconnected as soon as we can. I can see when it's disconnected, so uh, just hang on, the broadcast will resume if we do lose a signal. So we are entering Diocletian Palace to the south gate through the sea gate or it's called Bronze Gate. This was the smallest gate, actually emergency exit, and at that time, you know, sea was literally hitting those walls. It's a very unassuming kind of entrance. <laughs> you wouldn't think it's the entrance to a palace. On that board over there shows you that on October 26, 1979, UNESCO put the Diocletian Palace and the old town of Split on the World Heritage List. Uh, also the same year like uh, Dubrovnik Old Town, one of the first places in the world which were uh, put on this World Heritage uh, list. So let's go Let's see the place a little bit of the basement. Best, actually basements are the best preserved part of this. It is, yeah. Welcome to my office. <laughs> Your office is only 1,700 years old. Yes. <laughs> Wi-Fi well, might be a little spotty, but... Yeah. <laughs> can they see this map? Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, we can see it. So actually, this map shows you um, position of the palace in the area around our town. As you can see, palace is one really fantastic strategic uh, defending position because it's a nice natural protected bay. There are two islands in front, Braj and Sholta, and two big mountains behind, so Kozyak and Mosa. So excellent for defending, right? Two mountains in the back, two islands in front, and then you are in really nice natural protected bay. So Palace has one really fantastic strategic defending position. This area here is a Salona, which I mentioned before. This used to be city, fourth largest city of the whole Roman Empire, with population 60,000. Uh, many historians say probably this Salona was the birthplace of the Emperor Diocletian. That's why he decided to come back home uh, and made this palace nearby Salona. If you go there visit, you will still see remains of Colosseum, ground floor for 20,000 people, remains of the theater for 3,000 people, lots of sarcophaguses swing around, remains of necropolis, uh, basilica churches, forums. Let's say a good hour and a half or two hours walking around to see this beautiful archaeological site of Salona. Next time. Yes, maybe <laughs> next time. Yeah, we have a little more time. The yeah. line here shows you six miles long aqueduct, which was bringing running water inside of this palace from the spring in the mountain here spring of this river and actually after six months palace had the running water romans invented aqueducts there are still remains of the aqueduct on outskirts of our city and basically this is that same, still it's still same spring same river which today supplies whole city of split with the water so let's say that's the water which we just refer outside this is like olympic water okay <laughs> palace also plus running water had three had three springs of fresh water uh, also, palace had sewer system. So actually, if you can see that rocks with the holes right there, maybe that's the elements of the sewer pipes. Ah. So actually, palace had sewer system, so pipes which were collecting dirt waters and to take it out to the sea. We also discovered that in his private baths, uh, palace uh, had um, a system of low heating. Actually, hippocaust, so underground water channels with the hot water and cold water were mixing up. So actually, palace had running water, sewer system, floor heating. We're talking about 305 AD, beginning of 4th century. Palace was one very, very luxurious uh, and cool place to, to, to be here. In, the state of the art. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Okay, now, let's see at least, I hope we have still signal. At least, let's see the, the biggest complaint. Hope you guys can hear us and we're still being able to be broadcast. It looks like we are. Yeah, I think, I think it's okay, yeah. Okay? Yeah, it's quieter, which is okay, nice. Okay, guys, welcome. Welcome to the cellars, the major room. Um, uh, cellars are the best today, uh, the best uh, preserved part of the palace. And these cellars can be found only under emperor's home. You cannot find it under religious part or ordinary part. The reason for these cellars was to support emperor's home, to lift it up. And also, basically, they were used as a storage for food, wine, olive oil, because it's nice and cool inside. And at that time, of course, they didn't have electricity and refrigerators. So this was a food storage. 
and his home was up. But please imagine that this is this is this, this is how exactly looked the emperor's home on the upper floor. So let's say the basements are like mirror of the upper floor at that time, and today this is the only way how we can see his home. Okay. So uh, one of yes. the things I just wanted to comment about late Roman Empire architecture um, is that in the later Roman Empire, everything was bigger, right? It was sort of like uh, Costco size. <laughs> yeah, Romans, Romans like to make everything big, everything to last for forever. They invented, for example, in construction, they invented cement, concrete, they invented arches, domes, wall yeah. things, and all these elements you can find inside of this palace. So why do so the arches are here? Because arches and domes are the strongest constructive elements. That basically mean that you can put all weight of emperor's home perfectly sitting on this basement and nothing will collapse. That's why all these coming uh, shape uh, ceilings coming as arches. Yeah, so if you are seeing architecture in the Roman world that is monumental and bigger than what you might have seen in other parts uh, for the you know early Roman Empire, for example, that's because they just got bigger and bigger. I mean, kind of like in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, what is interesting about basements, if you were here and split in our town before 1959, you would not be able to enter to these basements. Because of these big holes above your head, there are some big holes yeah. that go all around. Uh -huh. In medieval times, people were making houses on upper floor. And you know, medieval ages is for a reason called the Dark Ages, because hygienic standards were very, very low. They forgot about toilets and sewer pipes from someone's head. So what are they doing? doing? They're digging these holes in the, in the ground floor of their homes, and all garbage waste and from toilets thrown down here. Oh. So basements in the medieval times was one huge black hole for the houses on the upper floor. And through the centuries, all this garbage went up, uh, became compost, stuck our basements, and actually preserved it because no saved it, because nobody could come inside and destroy them and, and to take rock, rocks like what happened with the upper floor and excavation started in 1956. So basically this part, uh, western part uh, excavated in 1959, eastern part 1995, still today 15% of this basement is still not excavated yet and still ah. going on construction. Wow. It's cool, okay. huh? Yeah, that Over is. Over there, that hole, which you see one hole down there, yeah. that's the first place where archaeologists entered here in uh, 1956, and they started digging from the top to the bottom. Wow. It took oh, only 10 years to make all this palace. Around 20,000 slaves are working really hard to finish only in 10 years, and all palace is made out of the famous limestone, which coming from our island branch, which is just across the channel. Out of this famous limestone is made some of the famous buildings like House of Parliament in Vienna, House of Parliament in Budapest, uh, parts of the Parliament in Berlin, Reichstag, Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, more than half of the Venice in Italy, and many people saying columns of White House in Washington DC. Even I'll be very honest with you, there are no documents for that, but there are many lots of legends about, uh, uh, um, about limestone in White House in Washington DC. Uh, on this island there are still quarries which operate from the Roman islands and on this, uh, from, from the Roman times and on this island there is the only stonemason school in Croatia, a secondary public school where kids from all over Croatia uh, coming to learn about old skills which was used in uh, Roman times and using Roman uh, uh, tools to, to, to do stone car, car and stone mason. Uh, stone mason. Uh, the hick of building this palace is a dry which means even Romans invented cement concrete, they didn't put cement concrete between these big rocks, it's a dry rock on dry rock, the same system how pyramids in Egypt were built or in Peru, Incas, and look at the cuts, perfect cuts. Um, they didn't have machines, no computers, you know, no drills, it took only 10 years to make this palace. What is also interesting how they put these rocks, let's say they are not, not all straight lined up, uh, from time to time you have rocks going like this, you can see, mm -hmm. to rock like this and then like this. Ah, okay. You see? Mm -hmm. And they don't put cement. Why? Because this is very shaky zone. We have lots of earthquakes here. So actually, if they, if they put cement here in the case of the earthquake, the palace will simply crack. So in this case, they lock the rocks on this way, but no cement. So in the case of a little shaking, palace is very elastic. It can a little bit move. So that it, that's why it's a really, really good construction. It shows you really good technique of trauma construction, Roman designing of this palace. Uh, upper floor ceiling, for example, that's a travertine. Travertine is much lighter than limestone and it's used for ceiling with, a, you know, connected with cement. You know. It is bigger than the biggest room. This was the emperor's uh, reception room. 
because it's the biggest, the most impressive, more re representative room. And this room is the only one actually which is connected with upper floor with two doors on the side. You can see one door over there. Second is, I don't know if we have signal guys here. We'll try it. I think we've got a signal, but we have. So yeah. the second door, this is yeah. two doors, which takes you to the actually to the emperor's home, and the only this room is connected. That should be fine. There we go. Okay. So. All right, we're back. Yeah, we lost the <laughs> signal because we are a little bit underground. Uh, we did better than I thought we would do, actually. <laughs> actually, at least you saw a reception room. Um, if you see everything on the, on the video here, maybe no reason to come to visit Split. So no. let's say something for our guys, for uh, for visitors. Absolutely. Right, they come to visit here. <laughs> actually, we can see some replacement of the limestone. This is the ah, okay. Limestone. So this is basically like seismic uh, retrofitting, because basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to make it so that lock, the, yes, they lock to, together. To make it, to make it stable, That's clever. I haven't seen that before. Yeah. That's really clever. Yes, these two stones are the same. Yeah. Except 1,700 years difference. So when palace original was built, it looked like this beautiful white, white and shiny. Well, wow, very course, cool. We have to replace some things from time to time because it's been 1,700 years here. But let's say palace is in pretty good shape. Uh, so if I'm reading my Roman runes correctly, I see a lot of holes in the, the stone. This would have all been stuccoed over, I bet. Would they have had frescoes over the top of these stones? Yes, yeah. Now we are in basements. Basements were not decorated. They were not. His okay. Home was up, remember, okay. this was only used for support emperor's home and for storage for food and wine. But on upper floor, there was lots of mosaic floors, frescas, which to, to, today you can find in archaeological museums. But but on our tour, I will show a little bit of Roman mosaics pres preserved. Okay. Okay. Great. So let's go outside. These are the two natural wells, uh, plus, plus running water, have two springs of fresh water. Oh, wow. And actually that's the original bedrock of the palace, of the basement. So actually palace sitting on one huge bedrock, massive rock, uh, uh, it looks like that. Great. Okay. This is something I guess that struck me when I first walked in here is that there are shops inside of the ruins. But that's true of the whole palace is that it's still used, right? This is all limestone from the uh, from the branch island and now we're going through the main corridor which was dividing basically living area and the dining area of the emperor so please imagine that walking through this basement it's like we're walking on upper floor to the emperor's home this was the main corridor which was connecting uh, his home with the emperor square actually okay so some souvenirs because you know people like to buy something memorable, special from this town, from this region. And it's good for supporting local economy as well. So, but it's just interesting how they yeah. still use it. I mean, this, this is not is something there. you see other Palace places. Is Palace is a living area. It's not like a like good place just go visit and live. It's a place where actually people live in, which yeah. is really that... Now here you can see one beautiful example of Roman mosaic. You see, it's very pretty. So this is original Roman mosaic in the original location. Yes. Yes, the Romans invented two th only two things in art, let's say. That's the mosaics and the frescas. They like to copy things from the Greeks and the Egyptians, you know. And this mosaic floor is a part of the big public baths, because palace in this area had public baths. On the other side, uh, emperor had his private baths, of course, with the floor heat. And this is remains of the mosaic floor, which you can more of this find in our beautiful archaeological museum of Split. Over there, over there is the emperor's mausoleum, the place where he was buried. But remember, I told you that in seventh century, Christians kicked him out of his mausoleum and his mausoleum was converted into the Christian Catholic cathedral. And uh, our cathedral in Split is the oldest and smallest Christian Catholic cathedral in the whole of the world. Bell Tower was added a thousand years after the palace and it took 300 years to make it. I know it sounds unbelievable, but why? Because Venice was, the Republic was ruling here from 1420 to 1797, but nearby was a, a powerful Ottoman Empire, Turkish Empire, and Venice and Ottomans were um, always, sometimes conflict, sometimes peace. So basically, uh, it took 300 years to make our bell tower, and you can see four, four stories of the, the four layers of the first floor, four stories of the bell tower is very different. 
So you can see first. It's Gothic. Arches, yes, yeah, like Gothic, 13th yeah. century when starting construction. Yeah. Then on first floor, Gothic changing into a little bit of Renaissance, but very shy Renaissance because there are no windows there. Yeah. The second floor, now middle of 15th century Renaissance developing, we see two, two windows. Uh -huh. And now fourth floor over there, you can see completely late Renaissance, 16th century. Okay. Uh, and the two more floors are the same, like late Renaissance. Wow. So which proves you that it took. 300 years people usually think I'm joking but no it took really 300 years we had to make it uh, which means it was good for locals who were making it. <laughs> they had a lifetime job <laughs> lots of work yeah <laughs> and this is all original stonework here which uh, is kind of something is original is something it? is okay. reconstruction you okay. know because uh, our, our history here is very heavy and split was very heavy bombard in World War II especially so basically uh, okay. there are also some reconstruction work on the palace okay but we can go this way here So for those of you who are just joining us now, uh, good morning to you. And we are in Split, Croatia, exploring Diocletian's palace. I'm here with my co-conspirator, uh, Andrew Vallone. Not at all. <laughs> on the backup camera. Yeah, on the backup camera. And uh, on, the, on the, the guiding today, we have uh, Yoshko, who is a local guide here in Croatia. Yeah. What's the name of your company? How can people reach you? It's a walking tour of Split. Okay. Um, we're doing a historical walking tour of Palace and the old town. So, guys. What you, What is your website? Uh, www.walkingtourofsplit.com. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> easy, easy right? We got some Mediterranean, this typical vegetation, figs, pomegranate, olives, bougainvillea. Uh, this part of the palace is very empty. Why? Because I just mentioned because of heavy World War II bombardment. You know? um, that's why many things are gone. But as you can see, people are still living inside of this, inside of these houses. That's the eastern wall of the palace over there. Yeah. So you could theoretically buy a house in Diocletian's palace? Uh, yes, you can buy, but you know what? It's not easy to find someone who will sell you because the locals are very proud to live inside of the palace. That sure, palace yeah, cool, of course. Cool place uh, to live. So if you are very lucky, you know, yeah. you can maybe find someone. someone All right, someday. <laughs> someday. I'll put that in my goals. <laughs> Now we come in, at least something is preserved on upper floor. This is uh, the dining room for the emperor. Wow. Yeah. This is his dining room. And uh, we discovered a beautiful marble dining table, which today you can find in the city museum of uh, Split. So this was the place where they had nice lunches, nice dinners. We discovered a beautiful purple white marble table, semicircular like this. And there was a uh, one big couch around this table because Romans were eating in this kind of position. Yeah. They had chairs, but only for kids and servants. They were lying, <laughs> lying down on couches. Emperor was right here. So you see guys what's in front of him. There used to be 42 arches, beautifully open through fresh air and the sea view. And in front of him was the biggest arch right there. So while he's having nice dinner lunches, he could enjoy the sea view. I thought you meant Andrew was the view. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, I, I used to remember coming to split with the big sea view. What happened, man? That was like a thousand ah, something. Ah, yeah. <laughs> it looks a little bit like, uh, like, the, like the emperor. I knew you were older than me. I didn't know you were that much older than me. I should be way more cranky than I normally am. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to tell you now a uh, little story of the Emperor of okay, Shall we go over to see that? Yeah, sure, that sounds good. Let me just get, I'm going to get everybody a view. Yeah. Hope you guys are doing well. If you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the comments, and I will try to read them to Yoshko, although I'm not seeing a lot of comments. So I'm, maybe I'm not getting them. Oh, look at that. You can eat dinner out there. <laughs> Crazy. Oh, this is a beautiful view. You can see the tower. Yeah, you can see the bell tower, symbol of our town of the patron Saint Sandomius, Saint Duya, who we celebrate on May 7th. And also you can see original mausoleum of the emperor, which is in 7th century converted into the Christian Catholic cathedral. So our cathedral is split, we are very proud to say, the oldest and the smallest Christian Catholic cathedral in the whole of the world. Uh, Pope John Paul II was there in 1998. There is his little memorial bench where he was praying in front of the sarcophagus of our patron saint. Um, and let me tell you a few words about the emperor who made this fantastic palace. His career started as a soldier, he became the general, then he became the emperor with the age of 40. 
and he ruled for 20 years from 284 to 305 which was pretty amazing uh, for the third century why because third century was really really messy and problematic in the empire after 200 years of pax romana of roman peace because you know barbarians invading from everywhere there there was a military anarchy in only 50 years before this emperor Diocletian, there were 30 emperors in 50 years which means every year year and a half a new emperor he's coming to rule for 20 years which was really really amazing and he did so many changes reforms uh, for the empire politically economically financially territorially and military reforms for example military he developed up army from 300 to 600 thousand soldiers he defeated all barbarian tribes in 20 years he didn't lose single one military battle his nickname was the emperor on a horse because he was always in wars he was in egypt a couple of times fixing problems revolutions and he also defeated Persia. Persia was eternal Roman enemy for 700 years in war with Rome. He defeated Persia and provided peace for Romans for next 50 years from them. So let's say military, he was very successful. Territorially, he realized, because he was smart general, that empire was too big for one man. So what did he do? Basically, he shared power with three other emperors. So he invented system of tetrarchy, and tetra, tetra in Greek language means four. So actually, he shared power with three other emperors. So second emperor was Max Maximilianus, third one was Galerius, actually son-in-law for the emperor Diocletian, and fourth one was Constantine Chlorus. Another new thing politically that Rome was not capital city anymore during his ruling. Why? Because he didn't want to put all power in one place. So basically, now you have four capital cities for four emperors. So our emperor Diocletian, he made palace in Turkey, in Nicomedia. Today that's Izmir town nearby Istanbul. Maximilianus, his best friend, he was in Milan in Italy. Galerius, his son-in-law, he was in Thessaloniki in Greece. And fourth one, Constantinus Chlorus, he was in Germany in a city called Trier. So basically two on east, two on west, very smart for easier ruling. But let's say Diocletian was like a uh, big boss, let's say. Um, also, um, economically, he completely uh, restored the empire because he put people on big public works, he organized big public works for the people. Uh, they described him very crazy about construction, where you can see from the size of the palace. He also made in Rome the biggest parts for 3,000 people. And he wrote one declaration of the prices. Basically, he put all prices the same in the empire. And when you put all prices the same, no reason for inflation, right? Politically, also, he abolished the Senate as a Roman parliament, and he pronounced himself son of the Jupiter, son of the top Roman god, and actually he had all absolute power in his hands. If you like legal system or justice system, today in Croatia and most of the Europe, we use Roman laws for the basics of our laws, so 70% or two-thirds of our laws today coming from the Ephesian days. So he did fantastic things for the empire for 17 years, and then something weird happened, he started to persecute Christians. Most likely happened this, even his wife and daughter were Christians, but he said he's son of the God, and then you have Christians who worship Jesus Christ, so probably that caused some problems for him, uh, hurt his big ego, and he started to persecute Christians, and there are some estimations that during his persecutions died more than half of our Christian saints, we're talking about more than 5,000 Christian saints. He was in Rome only once, in 20 years of ruling at the very, very end, and um, he went to celebrate one big military triumph. He didn't like Rome, citizens of Rome, the way how they decadently lived down there. Citizens of Rome didn't like him either. Why? Because Rome was not a capital city anymore. He made them to pay taxes and they didn't have to pay taxes before Emperor Diocletian. And you know, so he didn't want to stay to the end of the games in Rome. He went back to Turkey on the way back. He got a stroke. Soon after stroke, um, he woke up in Turkey and he said, I'm done. He took off his purple coat and he said, that's it for me. <laughs> the show is over. Now I'm going to enjoy my retirement here in Paris. Smart guy. <laughs> so basically, he's the only Roman emperor who survived to enjoy his retirement, let's say, who voluntarily decided to abdicate to leave the throne. He's coming here. He lived for 10, 11 years enjoying this palace here. His wife stayed in Turkey, which is also very interesting. She's, she was not here with him. And actually, after two years of living here, again, problems. Now barbarians coming back again. People fighting who's going to be the next emperor, and they call him to come back. He sent one really fantastic letter from this palace. Today, that letter is the most famous statement of his life. So letter says like this. If you could only see my beautiful cabbage, 
which I'm planting inside of my palace and split with my own hands, you would never ask me to come back. <laughs> See, I told you, cabbage yeah, farmer. You, cabbage, <laughs> you know, he was bragging about cabbage. That basically, message was, leave me alone, I want to enjoy my retirement. Or maybe he became vegetarian, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's up to you. But actually, unfortunately, we don't know how he died. That part is lost. Um, at the age of 70, 71, we never discover evidence of his sarcophagus here because, remember, I told you that Christians arrived here, there were so many of him, they want to get rid of any, any evidence of his existence here. After Diocletian Palace remained property of the Roman Empire, and uh, after Emperor after Diocletian was, of course, Constantine the Great, uh, because he legalized Christianity 313, and 330, he was the founder of Constantinople as a new capital and a new Rome. If our Emperor Diocletian then start to persecute Christians, Today, probably, he would be remembered as the number one Roman emperor, the most important in all 500 years. But guess what? Today, he's not even top 30. You know why? You know who's writing history? The winners. Yep. And in this case, winners were Christians. So basically, if you're going to read any encyclopedia book about Roman Empire, you will read only two things about him. That he designed a system of tetrarchy for mm -hmm. emperors, and that he persecuted Christians. Today, actually, history doesn't remember him very good. Um, but, so just yes. if I could just yeah. add a little comment here. Yes. Um, Diocletian, you have probably heard me talk about before, because he's the one who persecuted so many Christians, as he mentioned. Santa Lucia is a good example of one that she uh, she died under his persecution. Um, so he's well known in the Catholic Church as being sort of this evil emperor. But just to put that into historical context, in the 300s, Christianity was not an underground religion anymore. It was almost the religion, but nobody was allowed to practice it. So this is why if you come to Rome before and you've gone to San Clemente, for example, people were having their services underground, but they were starting to get pretty bold. And so Diocletian had the problem that the state religion religion was paganism, but the actual religion of the people was Christianity. So his crackdowns were to try and keep the pagan ways of the past. Constantine is going to come next and he's going to be smart enough to recognize that in fact Christianity is an unstoppable force and you may as well get on the bandwagon rather than have to do these constant crackdowns like Diocletian had to do. Also, Constantine's mom was Christian. So if that tells you something that Constantine's mom is going to be the same generation as Diocletian, and she was already Christian. So that I think is a good point of perspective is that he was in a desperate situation trying to hang on to the past, but Constantine represents the future, which was Christianity. Yeah, okay, that was a little story about our emperor, Diocletian. And now let's continue. This used to be his uh, personal promenade with the 42 arches, which used to be beautifully completely open to the to the fresh sea breeze so for the sea view and uh, which we're getting just a lovely fresh breeze right now it's yeah, wonderful now you will see all these arches so actually he's prominent for walking to enjoy his time after dinner after lunch relaxing so you can see now beautiful view over there oh so yeah see. look at that nice breeze yep nice it's very nice i'd live here if i was a retired roman emperor i'd grow my cabbages here <laughs> yeah, obviously it was, it was something magical here in this uh, cabin. <laughs> Hola, Jorge, <laughs> good morning. <laughs> here we have one original door from that time. This reserved door, as you can see. Because this was a part of the central corridor to the emperor's apartment, which was dividing the uh, living area with the dining area. Uh, in his uh, original, in his house, which you can see down there through the basement, there are more than 50 rooms, actually, for for living. And this was a central corridor, which was uh, taking emperor uh, to the emperor square, and this was, like, say, main entrance to his home. So we're going, we going over there to the main emperor square. And my assumption from looking at this is this would not have been bare stone, right? It would have been covered in marble uh, or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it used to be lots of, uh, we discovered 17 different colors of mosaics, for example, floor, which was used for decoration of this palace, which you, today you can see in the Archaeological Museum, yeah. which give us, let's say, a little perspective how actually palace really look rich and look luxurious. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we have to go over there, but okay. the not through the glass. Yeah. Now we walk into the emperor's home, but as I told you before, 
on upper floor, we cannot realize actually how his home looked like because now we're walking through the medieval times. Okay. We're walking through all this, you know, hundreds of houses from medieval ages, but to realize how his home originally looked like, we have to explore down the cellars, which we just gave you a little bit, a little touch glimpse how that looks like. So I do have a question from a viewer. Um, the, this viewer asks, I wonder what Roman law that still exists today would be considered kind of weird in modern times. Is there one that exists that's a little bit strange? Ooh, that's a tough I'm question. I'm not sure. I'm not a lawyer or something like that. I'm not <laughs> sure. But um, good, good some, some question to think, think about, maybe to do my little research. Yeah. Uh, Spit is a fantastic place because when you come to visit this place, uh, it's always leave you some, some, some questions in your head. So maybe they, this can inspire you to a little more uh, find out about, uh, about uh, our town and about the Roman time and Diocletian. Uh, yeah, I have a I have a reference book at home of law, uh, law Roman law. I'll have to look through it. <laughs> okay, now we're going to see the vestibule. Okay, vestibule is preserved. Oh, beautiful! Well, look at that. Guys watching, probably you will see lots of these metal things in uh, in Dalmatia. This is the medieval system for earthquakes, actually. Yep. You know, because this iron bar going through the wall, we tied it at the end, so basically if you have any movements in a, in a, in a building, you know, it holds the wall together. And we're coming to the vestibule. This was the main entrance to the emperor's home. Oh, this is beautiful. Big slabs of marble. Oh, gorgeous. Okay, watch this. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh, beautiful and oculus. Okay, so this room circle room is called vestibule and in roman houses was always free entrance to something very important function of vestibule is actually to impress you like to prepare you that you're going to enter something very very special originally was covered with a dome but over the time dome is gone and remember i told you he invented the system of tetrarchy four emperors so these four holes were designed to put four statues of four emperors so Diocletian, Maximilianus, Galerius, and Constantinus Chlorus. And Constantinus Chlorus was Constantine's father, is that right? Am I Sorry? Constantinus Chlorus, that was Constantine his... Constantinus Chlorus was father of Constantine the Great. Yeah. And Saint Helena was the mother of Constantine the Great, yeah. who 313 legalized Christianity. Okay. And actually, this is the original door. This has been um, lots of restoration done. Why? Because of World War II bombardments, but it was very heavy damage, so they need to restore with some new new bricks and new new cement. Now let's go to this door. We're going to go to the Emperor Square, the heart of the old town because our cathedral is over there. But that was the only place where the actually emperor was meeting with the locals who were living in the north side of the palace. Okay. okay. So let's okay. walk to the tower preserved from the Roman time. This is extremely cool. So just a little spin around here. Yeah, this is very acoustic and usually we have, when it's normal here, we have singers here, a club, a, cap, a cappella uh, singers, the seven, eight singers together, then they singing some Dal Dalmatian traditional songs and you can find them here, but this year, unfortunately, because of this little... Yeah, the a cappella singing is called Klapa, that's very popular. This is very cool. It's a beautiful piece of architecture, very well preserved too. Where's the heart and the soul of our town because our cathedral is over there. But in Diocletian time, this was the meeting spot. So actually, the emperor who was living in the south part with the people who lived in the northern part, this was the meeting spot and he was doing his speeches here. As you can see, there are two different levels. One level is up for the emperor, the second level is down for the people because everybody who wanted to see the emperor must come on this square, lay down on the floor, completely full body down like this because they were not allowed to be in the same level with the son of the god. That's why we have level one up for the god, one level down for the people. So we're standing where the emperor would stand. Exactly. So we're the emperors, yeah? 
Yeah, but the emperor is okay. doing some speeches for the locals. Ah, we are the emperor. We've got, okay. we've got three, so we need one more. We need four, ah, we four need tetras. Four, right? yeah, yeah. I'm sure we get the proper, just like, hey, you over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can get one here. Reed is not here, so Reed is our other tetrarch. So he, he's right here. There we go. So those yeah. are our tetrarchs. <laughs> Okay, so I can explain you a little bit of the square. Okay. So when you come to this square, I like to greet people actually with one greeting, welcome to the Times Square of Squares. Like Times Square in Europe, but a little bit different than New York Times Square. Why? Because when you're on this square, you can actually travel through the time, through all this history. And I'll explain you how. So actually first, what is cool, think here, the oldest thing in our town, it's an Egyptian Sphinx. So it's 3.5 thousand years old. That's, this thing is, is, Sphinx is the oldest thing in our town. It was originally brought from Egypt, personally by the emperor, because remember I told you he was a couple of times in Egypt and he was uh, fixing some revolutions down there. On the way back, he brought these Sphinx, let's say politely, he borrowed them from Egyptians and he brought them here for decoration of the palace. He put them in front of the, uh, his mausoleum, in front of the Jupiter temple, which you're going to see soon. And actually original out of 12 Sphinx in our town today, only three preserved. Uh, one still sitting here, as you can see. Second one is in front of the Jupiter Temple, which you will see. And third one is in Archaeological Museum. Uh, you can see she was a little bit damaged, but uh, that's why, because uh, when Christians arrived here in the uh, 7th century, for them that was a symbol of paganism, they, uh, they destroyed uh, these things. Uh, another thing from Egypt here is this red granite columns. You can see here. Okay. Red granite columns, they are also originally brought from Egypt and uh, they are monoliths, which means they are made out of one piece of the rock. Originally, the palace had 200 of pieces of, the, of these rocks, today only around 20, 20 percent. So first you have Egyptian times in our school. Then top of the columns, the top of the columns is a Corinthian style, which is actually Greek style. The all layout of this square, plus our mausoleum, is Roman times, 305. Okay, so warm up, warm up. For warm up, you have Egyptian times, you have Roman times and Greek times. Then you have medieval ages, like remember, I told you. It took 300 years to make our wall tower from 13th to 16th century. But only 10 years for the palace itself. Only 10 years for the palace <laughs> and uh, 300 years for the bell tower. Yeah. Then you have two Renaissance chapels this one and that one. Maybe we can go down so you can better see for your... For your... Sure. Um, I just wanted to tell you that my uh, my Egyptian sister Hoda in Cairo just commented that she'd like her Sphinx back. Can you arrange that? What do you think? Could you, can you ask the Croatian government to give the Sphinx back to my friend Hoda in Cairo? Yes, uh, we, uh, we will take good care of them. We will take good care of them. Ah, oh, darn it. Sorry, Hoda. I tried. <laughs> this, is, this is their home now, but uh, we're taking good care of them. Don't, don't, go, don't worry, guys. I, I, don't worry. I, I promise. Maybe one day we will mail you back, you know, but for, for now, they are in time. So, just to continue the Times Square, okay. you can follow. So, there are two Renaissance chapels, one built in the 16th century, another in the 17th. They are both dedicated to Virgin Mary. On the left side of this square, you have three houses of three famous noblemen families from Sweden. So first one is the oldest. It's a Gothic style, 13th century. These two are made in Renaissance, 15th and 16th century. And balconies are made in Baroque. Baroque is architecture of 17th and 18th century. So basically on the left side, you have six different times, six different styles. In the left corner there, you can find the Renaissance Chapel of St. Rocco from 16th century. Why? Because St. Rocco was protector for the plague. Uh, so almost in Dalmatia, every village has one little chapel of St. Rocco. Behind St. Rocco Chapel, there are two buildings from recent communistic time. Uh, because time was heavy bombarded in World War II. So after World War II, 1950 and 1960, we had to make two, uh, two buildings uh, with the socialistic architecture. Also, you can see on the second building some holes. You see some holes over there? Yeah. That's a bullet hole from the Homeland War 1991. When Spit was under attack, you know, that's, a, that's the evidences of the 1991. So let's say standing on this square, if you guys do 360 around you, let's do it. We travel from Egyptian times, through the Greek and Roman times, through all medieval ages. So Gothic, Renaissance, Baroque balconies, mm -hmm. to the recent communistic times and the recent homeland war. So guys, welcome to the real time square. That is fantastic. 
Yeah. It's almost 2,000 years in just one spot, you yeah, can see. Three and a half thousand years because of uh, oh, that's true. things are old, what, 3.5 3. thousand years. Yeah. They are made Excellent. of black ground. You can also something from 21st century. Here is that security cameras already. Oh, there you go. All right. And us. And us. We're, well, we're 20th century. Andrew and I are relics of the 20th century. So. Basically, later, if you're going to go visit Little Big Cathedral, momently, we're praying, you know, because today is a religious holiday, Corpus Christi. So, moment is close for visitors. It's only for a mass. But the cathedral is really beautiful to visit. You can also climb to the top of the bell tower. And now we are going to see the Jupiter tower. Excellent. Ah, oh, you're great. I'm enjoying this. I hope everybody at home is enjoying our uh, tour of Di uh, Diocletian's Palace here in Split with Yoshko. Hi, guys. And give us again your website. Yes, www.walkingtourofsplit.com. All right, so if you come to Split, you can hire him and have a walk uh, in person. And actually, today we're just doing, I think I'd call a sampler tour. He usually does three hours. Today we're only doing a little over an hour, uh, but we are really enjoying this. And thank you, Andrew, for setting this up because he's a friend of Yoshko's. So. Yeah, guys, look at, the, look at the streets. People think usually it's a marble street. And no, these streets used to be rough like this. This is a limestone. Oh. But 350 years of walking on this, you know, every hour step leaves some trace, so it's really nice polished. It looks almost like marble, you know. If you take a look on the side a little bit, you will see the side is still a bit rough. Yeah. Because people don't like to walk on the side, people like to walk in the middle, middle of the street. Hmm. Okay. So I think we're coming up on my one of my favorite things in Split. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's ah. not what you think it is. What, what is it? What is it? Oh, ah, Jupiter. Yeah. Ah, a restaurant, Mexico. <laughs> The only Mexican restaurant. Okay. There is real Mexican food here. What? There is real Mexican food. Oh, are we having margaritas for lunch? We are. We're having yeah. margaritas for lunch. We, de we definitely are. Sweet. All right. Done. Sorry, you guys. I don't really like Croatian food. <laughs> We're going to have Mexican food. <laughs> uh, no, the Sea Oregon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So guys, here we are in front of the Jupiter Temple. Wow. Remember I told you he proclaimed himself son of the Jupiter, son of, son of the top Roman god. So probably the emperor was coming here every day to, to pray for his god. When, because this was that religious part. And now we can hear the bells, you know, bells of the, of the uh, bell tower. When Christians arrived from Salona in 7th century, they reused this Jupiter Temple. Um, because cathedral was very small, there was no room for baptizing new Christians. Um, Christians decided to, to reuse this Jupiter temple as a baptistery for baptizing new Christians and their name is St. John Baptistery because St. John uh, baptized the, the Jesus Christ. And uh, you can still see original carving details from the Roman times. This is really fine carving actually for this point in the Roman Empire. You can, all, yeah, you can also see some uh, yeah, on the top, above the door, you will see some faces and heads. You see them? Oh, look how beautiful. Yeah. yeah. This is some different Roman gods and goddesses. Yeah. So, for example, on the corner there, uh -huh. if you come a little bit from here, maybe. Okay. On the corner is a Victoria, goddess of victory. Ah. Then you have two masks from the theaters. Yeah. Then you have two Tritons, son yeah. of the Neptune's god of the sea. Okay. Then you have Sol, god sunshine. Then you have Hercules, son of the Jupiter, because eagle next to him represents the Jupiter. We're, we're right here. Then Apollonius, god of beauty, prettiness, uh -huh. and also finishing with Victoria, goddess of victory. So this little bit uh, Roman uh, gods and goddesses, Christians didn't destroy, so today we can enjoy. That is incredible, actually, because, yeah, again, for, for this time period, if you're in, in Rome itself, the art is not so fine anymore, and that is beautiful carving. So it's just that they didn't make nice stuff in ancient Rome. <laughs> they made it here because that's where the, the emperor lived. Yeah. This is one of sarcophaguses from 1500, one of the archbishops on Spet. We have lots of these sarcophaguses. If you come in to visit, you will see they lay all around, especially in Salona and this archaeological site. It was a coffin for burying people. Wow. Yeah. Uh, this Gorgeous. This here is without head. I told you, on, on, on the Times Square, that's the, the only one with the head. This one is without head because, you know, it was destroyed by the Christians in Samuel. Maybe you can send that to my friend in Hoda. <laughs> my friend Hoda in Egypt. You can send her that one. Yes, oh, okay. <laughs> because I like to write them. <laughs> you can find it. Like one big line. Now we're going to walk to the smallest street in our town. 
and the name on this street is Let Me Pass. Oh, is it really? <laughs> yeah. Oh. This is the smallest street in our town. We say in the world, probably not true, sure, but in our town for sure. So the name of street in Croatia is Pani Pani Pusti Meda Projem, which means actually let me pass. Because <laughs> only one person at a time. All right, one at a time, Andrew. All right. Don't try to get in front of me. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta suck in the shoulders here. <laughs> Yoshko, have you been to uh, Kirk Island? Yes. There's that one town, uh, Vrbnik. It's got the narrowest street in the world. Is it? Is it shorter? It, it's it, narrower. It, it, it's it narrower. Then you, you have really have. Uh, then this one is, is, is the narrowest and split, and yeah. shortest. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you can see beautiful backside from the Jupiter Temple. This temple and uh, Times Square used to be, when I was a kid, a little bit darker because of timing, you know, it used to be like dark, like this. Yeah. And it took 10 years of cleaning, lasers with lasers, you know, a little cleaning to get this polished white, white uh, look what you see. I'm just really impressed by how well preserved, preserved it is. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's something in, you don't really see. And it's exactly, it hasn't been rebuilt, right? No, no, just cleaned with the lasers. Just cleaned. Yeah. yeah, that's really impressive. And if you look through here, this is one restaurant, but if you look through the window, basically inside of this restaurant was the private baths for the emperor, and this is the place where we discover system of floor heating for him. Ah. So actually, columns made of bricks. Mm -hmm. On top of the columns was a floor. Mm -hmm. So actually, they boil the water, yeah. release it between these uh, channels, and hot water produced steam, of course, going up. So he had nice floor heating, and it was right here in his, in his private bath. Oh. It's fancy, huh? Yeah. So now we're going this way. Okay. Oh, that's a very charming street. Yeah. So we're in Diocletian's Palace here in Central Split. So the center of the city, the old town, is Diocletian's Palace. It's not just a palace. It's not something you buy admission to necessarily. To see the basements, yes. But to walk around is free because this, look at that. There's a restaurant built in Diocletian's Palace. <laughs> It's just bars, restaurants, you know, people like to stay, have fun, have a drink, have, yeah. have a lunch, dinner because it's very authentic sound. And there's hotels you can actually stay there's in hotel. Diocletian's you Palace. See, you can see one original Roman arch. Oh yeah, look and at that. In medieval times people make made house on the arch. So basically people li literally living on the arches. And arches are not connected with cement. This is a typical, you know, Roman arch uh, yeah. with a keystone in the center and no no cement, no connection in between or more. It's crazy. So, so if you come here, you can actually sleep in a hotel that's in the ruins. So it's sleeping in an archaeological park, archaeological park and eating in an archaeological park. That's just crazy. Now we are in one of the two main streets. Remember the two main streets are dividing, uh, let's say, which connecting mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, the West Gate and Iron Gate. Okay. Here you can see the Iron Gate. Oh yeah. Through that door, that's the old town from medieval ages. Okay. And if you turn around, you will see Silver Gate way down with the wheel. Ah, there you go. So just yep. for your orientation, guys, how big this palace is. The palace is big, like, like six soccer fields. So it's huge, enormous. Sometimes people come here in the palace and ask me, my friend, help me, I'm looking all morning. I'm looking, where is your palace? I cannot find it. And I say, my friend, you are inside of the palace. Yeah. People actually don't really realize it's like palace is actually town, not just one little house. Yeah, it's your old town. It's not like an archaeological site. You just go pay to now see. We're going towards Golden Gate. Yeah. Uh, remember slope, which I was telling you. Mm -hmm. The palace sitting on the slope. Here you can see the slope way uh, nicely up. And how do you make difference? What's the Roman times in town? What's the medieval times? So actually, all these big rocks are made by Romans. They like everything big, everything you know, to last for forever. And these small rocks are built in the medieval times. That's kind of no difference what's the Roman, what's the medieval times. For example, here this wall, half is a Roman, half is a medieval time. Because palace has been, you know, changed over the over the century. You can also see the restoration, the difference. We've got some singing going for you. You can hear some music. I'm singing. community of Italians in our town 
and they have singing a little bit in Italian. And this is entrance, you see, Comunità della, della Italiani. This oh. is entrance to the space where they're hanging out. And it's interesting, one little detail, you can see this line with the wings, ah. which actually symbolizes Venice Republic, yep. San Marco. And Venice was here for almost 400 years, ruling over Dalmatia. And somewhere in Dalmatia, you will see that this line holds open book, like here, but mm -hmm. somewhere you will see the line has closed book. Yep. And do you know the difference? I do. Yeah? Open book is? Open book is times of peace. And closed? Times, times of war. Times of war. Of course, let's close book, let's go for a fight, right? <laughs> so it's a little evidence of Venetians um, ruling here in Dalmatia. Maybe we can hear some Italian songs here. That was delightful. <laughs> Very atmospheric. Thanks for arranging that for us. Yeah, yeah, that's the moment, uh, but, You're uh, so good, Yoshko. I want to say to you. <laughs> and also having all the nuns walking around behind us. Thanks for organizing all these extra special visual treats. <laughs> yeah. Lots of little bars, restaurants, towers. Today will be quiet because of holiday. But it's holiday. Uh, I want to show you something here. We have lots of these murals in Dalmatia. So actually, this is Diocletian Palace. Just for you to, to see what are we doing, we started our tour from here, mm -hmm. went to the Bronze Gate. Uh, we a little bit, a little bit saw his home through the basements. Then we went up. We saw the real dining room here. Mm -hmm. We had to hear a story of the emperor. Then this is the vestibule and shows to his home. This is the Peristyle Emperor's Peril Times Square mausoleum, and the bell tower was built right here. It's dedicated to our patron saint of St. Domius. This is our patron saint, St. Louis, local, locally said St. Domius. And his big day is uh, celebration day is May 7th. He was Bishop of Salona and he was killed during the Diocletian persecutions. Um, this is Silver Gate, Iron Gate. Now we are right in this part here. We are going towards the Golden Gate. And remember, I told you big rocks, that means that's a Roman times, which you can see here. Here we have some big rocks. So this here was the end of that aqueduct. Remember, six ah. miles of aqueduct, which was bringing water from the spring in the mountain, after six miles finishes right here. And this was the end of the aqueduct, and then huge quantity of water would come into the palace and was distributed all around with the underground water channels. After 1,700 years, water still coming on the Oh, look at that, so you can fill your water bottle. I will, I will do it right now, and I'll make it Okay, that's really cool. I told you, split, drink split water, maybe with some Olympic medal. <laughs> <laughs> it's the water of Jivali. This is the water of the emperors. Yeah, this is from the, still from the same spring, from the same river. Aqueduct, of course, is not anymore in use, but uh, uh, we still use, the city still use the same, uh, let's say, language path of uh, following the aqueduct underground to bring water to the inside of our, in fact, inside of our city. Wow, that's cool. Cool, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, we have two religions here in, in Croatia. Croatia, uh, they are Catholics. Yeah. Eighty-six percent we are Catholics. What you can see on this wall. Second religion is soccer. What you can see. On this wall. <laughs> I would say one hundred percent. You know. So it's like we call it like we have two religions. You know, uh, soccer, Catholics. <laughs> How did your team do in the last World Cup? Uh, it's a national. It's a local, uh, local club. They play in the Croatian national league. Uh, this season we were fourth, which is actually not very good for us. We always like to be in the very, very, very top. But we hope for the next better days, let's say, which kind of sure. we will have some better results throughout We have little galleries, little shops, bars, restaurants, a um, little bit of everything. People live all around. As you can see, there are no gardens. It's not easy to live in palace. You know, I told you, no gardens, no parking lots. They must cruise every day around town to find parking spot. But you can get coffee. You can get coffee, beer, whatever. This is actually the only garden in the palace. Oh. To do. The only green area, green zone. Uh, as you can see here, you can have feeling how people live inside. Um, there are some ropes connecting with the uh, neighbor with neighbor with the uh, laundry. Because <laughs> here we don't use dryers, we use the good weather. And uh, you can see a little bit of fruits, tangerines, lemons, olive, pomegranates. You can see satellite dishes, air conditioned boxes. So actually, this is a, a living, living area 
uh, you know, it was always m middle class, working class living inside of this palace. They inherited those those properties, which is today the biggest price. If you want to buy some property, you pay the biggest price in, in our town. Yeah, also, imagine. another one interesting detail is one head of the swings. It's right there. Oh. It's pretty unusual, right? It's a 3.5 thousand years old head of one of the small swings with some local farm and then they basically they stick it on their house to make they made their house uh, more beautiful. Less. Fancy, yeah. Now their house is fancy. <laughs> At least they have nice garden view. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he had nice smile. The guy, the guy needs to open up a falafel shop there. You know, it's oh, like it would be perfect. It's like come to the Sphinx Head. Uh, Egyptian food. Yeah, it needs to be an Egyptian restaurant. Split, split city, and inside you can find beautiful that dining table, which we discovered. You know, for the emperor for his eating, it's really nice preserved. And now we are on the second of that two main streets. We are on a Cardo Street, which connects Golden Gate with the Emperor Square. Okay. We're going towards Golden Gate. Another fun fact, guys, I don't really like fun facts. We know who made the biggest piece of chocolate in the world. This chocolate shop from Split. Oh. You can see certificate of Guinness World Record. Wow. 1,100 uh, square feet. It was built. Oh my gosh. There's a picture over in there. In Diocletian's Palace, yes, they built. It was built in uh, 2015. Uh, owner was celebrating 25th birthday of the shop, so he said he want to make the biggest chocolate in the world. It took uh, 15 workers to work all night. They used 1,600 pounds of chocolate, of dark chocolate, and in the morning it was gone. In half an hour, it was free for locals, you know, to take it home. And actually, then he got a award of the um, certificate of Guinness World Record, the, officially the biggest piece of chocolate. And let me guess, it was sponsored by the dentists of Split, right? <laughs> Yeah. They paid for it? <laughs> Actually, he sponsored it. It was free. It was a gift for the locals. Oh, that's from, nice. From him to the locals. Okay. Last year, for 30th birthday, he wanted to make even bigger chocolate. He wanted to put all prominent on chocolate. Uh, where we started our tour, but unfortunately, last year in April, we were in lockdown, so he could not do it. But someday, still, someday. Someday, but still, still had the certificate. That's cool. He's the officially <laughs> largest piece of chocolate in the world. And oh, he also is a musician, so he also made with the chocolate records with one of his songs which you put when you put which you put on gramophone and it really plays. <laughs> so ten times really plays and then you got with your chocolate. Wow. So you can buy. That I didn't know we That is a very clever <laughs> chocolatier. You should have the SBA here and split. Yeah exactly. <laughs> you can help out some other less fortunate businesses. I feel like we need to do that, Andrew. We can put our, our 2022 tour schedule onto a chocolate record and send that out to everybody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we come to the Golden Gate. Over there are the three that funky windows are. Mm -hmm. Over there hi hiding the oldest and smallest chapel in our town, St. Martin Chapel from fifth century after Christ. St. Martin is a very important saint for us because he's protector for winemakers. So on St. Martin Day, which is easy to remember, it's 11, 11. November 11, we're baptizing new wine and the new wine drinking season starts. Okay, that's why he's very important for us. And over there in that, in that walls hiding the chapel of St. Martin. You got some <laughs> festivals going on, wine festivals going on around uh, Del Mar? Momently not. We used to have one in basement. But Looks like they are going to be filming something here. And we are exiting Diocletian's Palace. Yeah, any, any live music looks good, you know, even one-man show, you know. <laughs> Guys, here we are in front of the Golden Gate. Can you see because of the lights? Is okay? Or? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is the Golden Gate. The, this was the main entrance into this palace, the most beautiful entrance. You can see how it's really rich decorated. And this is actually part of the north wall, which you can see here. One of three preserved towers in town is that one on the corner there. Second preserved tower is at the end of this wall, but you have to go around that building to see it. Ah, okay. And third one is down on Promenade where we started our tour. So actually originally were 16 uh, defending towers, today three preserved. And you can see this holes 
one, two, three, four, five holes above the Golden Gate. Yeah. This was four holes for a statue of four emperors. In the middle hole was for a statue of the eagle. Eagles was symbolizing the Jupiter as a top Roman god. And you can see actually how people living inside of this world. It's maybe a little bit funny, but it's but it's working, you know. <laughs> now let's see the big man, Bishop Gregorio. Usually people think it's a wizard, but no, it's not wizard. It's a Bishop Gregorio who lives. It does in look like a wizard, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he looks. Like he has, but he has that bishop cap. Yeah, place. it's like Gandalf. So actually, he lived in 10th century, and he in 10th century he wanted to replace the Latin language in churches with Croatian language, which was idea 1,000 years ahead of his time. <laughs> and of course, Pope didn't like that idea very much. He didn't make success, but it was actually a great idea. Why? Because people didn't understand what priests saying in Latin language. People understand Croatian language. That's why he's holding a book in the left hand and with the right finger he's pointing how it's important to have national language in the churches so people can understand what, what priests actually are saying. He's made out of the bronze but he has a golden shiny toe. If you can see where that kid with a bicycle. Mm -hmm. So he has one little Actually, it's a bronze toe, but because people are rubbing, because here we say, if you make one wish, rub his toe, your wish will come true. So, because people are rubbing the bronze toe, it's all. Oh, let's go do that. Yellow. Let's go do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got, I got some, I got some wishes I want to make. So, uh, this wonderful piece is made by the world-class sculptor Ivan Mestrovich, whose nickname is Croatian Michelangelo. Mestrovic was living in the United States for 20 years after World War II. He was professor in Catholic College of Notre Dame, South Bend, Indiana. And so he has over there around ca campus 300 works. But the most, most let's say, significant work of Mestrovic in the United States is in Chicago, in Grand Park. Two big bronze statues of American Indians on horses, Iron Man and the Spearman. That was also made by the sculptor Mestrovic. And he was a big friend with Rodin, a French guy who made a tinker. And if you want to visit one really cool, cool museum out of 25 mu cool museums in town, uh, one of my favorite is Mestrovich Museum, 20 minutes walk from here, uh, beautiful setting nearby beach. So I really highly, highly recommend to visit, Very to cool. visit his. Uh, All right, here we go, you guys. Make a wish. I'm gonna. We can make a group wish. Everybody who is on the live stream right now, if you want to write your wish down, you can in the comments. And I'm gonna make my wish. Here we go. Yeah. Be humble with the wishes, okay? <laughs> All right, that was your chance, everybody. I was projecting, oh, actually, I'll put my hand on again. That was for my wish, now I'm gonna project your wish. Okay. Whatever your wish is, yeah, I'm projecting it through the phone here. Ow, now I can't hold it any longer because uh, it's, it's really hot. <laughs> it's, it's too warm, yeah. Uh, the things I do for my followers. I, I burn my hand for your wishes, so there you go. From my hand to, to God's ears. And guys, would you like one more fun fact for the end of the tour? We would, please. Oh, okay. Do you know what kind of tree is this here? Uh, eucalyptus? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Duh, 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 duh. Oh, carob! This is carob. Yeah. Carob is fake chocolate, substitute for chocolate, uh, artificial chocolate, but this actually is fruit. Let's say 100 years ago, when it was a big starvation in Dalmatia, people would take this carob, it must be dry like this, then people grind it, you get flour, then you can bake bread actually out of that. Oh. And today in restaurants you find carob cakes and carob brandies. Interesting thing about carob is seed of the carob. There are some seeds if you can maybe you shake it for the camera. Uh, for the camera. No, I'll for the camera. Shake, shake, shake. There, there are some seeds. I have one seed here. It's carob seed. And the fun fact is this: all the seeds inside of this carob bean always has always have pretty much the same weight it's always 0 0.2 grams or 0. Point. it's easy to remember it's like james bond number 0. 0.007 ounces which is official measurements weight and scale system for weight something you know to weight what 0. 0.2 grams 0. 0.007 ounces you like gold guys gold diamonds we're my best friend okay in ancient time carob seeds were used for weighting gold, so named carat, coming from carob on Greek language keration. So on Greek language, this is keration. First five letters is carat. That's how carat got the name because one carat, the weight of one carat, not purity, the weight of one carat of gold or diamond is exactly the weight of this carob seed, 0 0.2 grams or 0 0.07 ounces. And wow. in ancient times, and there was no money, uh, banknotes like today we pay with 
we pay with paper money at that time they didn't have that kind of money carob seeds were so valuable this was a currency for payment instead of the money so who says the money doesn't grow on trees <laughs> <laughs> and guys, I think this is a little the end of the tour. I mean, if you ask something else, maybe we can help. I, I hope just... you enjoyed this little quick tour, actually, to get at least a little bit overview of our beautiful town. Um, I personally hope you will come visit us, visit Dalmatia and Croatia, and that you will have some fantastic vacation time here. I have to thank uh, uh, both of these two guys here with me for this arranging this live stream for you. And I hope you enjoyed the tour and yes, hope to see you one day here. Absolutely fantastic, Yoshko. So thank you so much for joining us uh, today for this walk. Uh, I just want to remind you that Yoshko volunteered his time today to bring you around uh, Croatia virtually. Uh, so if you are interested and you would like to forward him a tip, you can go to my PayPal tip jar, uh, Sarah in Italia at yahoo.com, and I will forward him whatever uh, tips you want to give. Or if you want to buy Andrew, our cameraman over here, a glass of wine, I think he needs it. So. Oh, no, no, man, give, give, give it to Yoshko, buddy. This guy, this guy I mean, he, he, lo he loves the city. It's so obvious, and he knows everything, and he's got all these cool stories. So so I'll buy my own wine, but, but, but get, you know, make sure he gets... We will drink it all together. Don't yeah, worry. Guys. There you go. Margaritas. At margaritas. If anybody wants to buy us all a margarita for the, uh, as a tip for the tour, uh, that go to PayPal, and it's Italia at yahoo.com. And we thank you very kindly. Thank you so much for uh, sticking with us today. Uh, some of you haven't even woken up, and you're going to be watching this in replay, but please go ahead, like, share, all of that kind of good stuff, and spread the travel joy amongst everyone you know, because you know what? It's time. It's time to dust off our backpacks and travel, don't you guys think? Yeah, it's time to go on a uh, travel uh, roads. So guys, pack your bags, buy your tickets, and see you here, right? Yeah. Dalmatia expecting you. Yoshko's waiting for you. So, and it's, uh, tell me your website again. Uh, www.walkingtourofsplit.com Very there you simple. Go. Easy to find. Easy All right, everybody, thank you for joining us today. Um, so Andrew and I are going to continue our explorations of Croatia, and later today we're going to be in Zagreb. So we're going to be bringing you something from uh, Zagreb a little bit later or tomorrow. Uh, and we're going to just going to continue exploring. So thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> I think Andrew's just burned his butt. Too hot. Bronze is too hot. Yeah. Woo. yeah. <laughs> It is. All right. Bye, Talk guys. to you guys again soon. Thank you for ciao, watching. Ciao. Bye.